I am delighted to kick off this event on juvenile justice and the frontiers of developmental neuroscience. This is one of the many events in our fruitful collaboration, the Petrie Flom Center with the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, our project on law and neuroscience. The event topics really, I think, demonstrate the breadth of neuroscience. We've had events looking at trauma in the border, looking at elected officials, considering the role of artificial intelligence. We've had a lot of programming on the juvenile brain and what we know about developmental neuroscience. And I think it goes to show that neuroscience informs so much of what we do and frankly should inform even more when it comes to law and public policy. And I don't just say that because I'm married to a neuroscientist who continually tells me that what he does is the most important thing. So it is with no surprise that we have a full house because this is such a lovely topic. If you are interested in other events in this area or in the area of health policy and biotechnology, I encourage you to look at both the Petrie Farm and the CLBB websites for upcoming events. I know CLBB has a very full event calendar. The Petrie Farm Center does too. We have an event coming up looking at the role of artificial intelligence when it comes to the health of people with disabilities and age-related dependencies. That is on March 24th. I think that would likely be of interest to the audience. We also have an event coming up looking at medical debt, both in the context of African hospitals, especially when it comes to maternity and childbirth, as well as the treatment of medical debt in the American South. So please look up those events, look up the fantastic events at CLBB. I won't take up too much more of your time just to say that our panelists would also like to see the slides of the other panelists. So as the presentations go on, please don't worry if you don't see them up at the panel table during the talks themselves, but they will come up for the audience Q&A so you will have a chance to ask questions. Before we get to that, I also want to say a gentle, loving reminder that all questions probably could have a question mark somewhere within the first two sentences of what you say. <laughs> and if you find that is not applicable to your question, perhaps it is a comment that you would like to talk with the panelists about after the event, they'd be excited to talk to you. And with that, I'm going to kick it off to our moderator, Robert Kinscherf, who is faculty at the doctoral program in clinical psychology and associate vice president for community engagement at William James College and the associate managing director for the Center of Law, Brain and Behavior at MGH. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Carla. And good afternoon, everybody. Oh, the terrible congregation. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Much better, much better. Welcome to the talk on the next frontier of neuroscience and juvenile justice. And as Carmel mentioned, uh, this is uh, part of the collaboration between the Petrie Flom and the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior, a collaboration that is now in its fourth year. And we're very, very pleased to uh, see folks here. I'd like to acknowledge Glenn Cohen, Professor of Law and Faculty Director at the Petrie Flom, as well as Carmel uh, Schacher, who you just saw. She's the um, Executive Director, but also Dr. Christine Hutchinson, the Administrative Director, who helps us do all of the uh, planning and detail management for this. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, a couple of folks from CLBB uh, in the front row here, uh, Dr. Judith Edersheim. Uh, who is a co-founder and co-director of the Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior at Mass General uh, and has academic appointments uh, at Harvard Medical School and is attending psychiatrist at uh, Mass General Hospital. Uh, Francis Shin, um, a JD, PhD, he's our recently, relatively recently arrived executive director at uh, CLBB, but also is associate professor of law and a McKnight land grant professor at the University of Minnesota, where in his ample uh, spare time, he also runs his own neuroscience lab. And we've just been joined by uh, Judge Nancy Gertner, uh, retired from uh, the federal courts here in Boston and uh, one of our uh, spiritual and intellectual uh, inspirations over time. So the topic today is um, 
one that's been unfolding since about 2005, the Roper Supreme Court decision finding unconstitutional the execution of persons for capital crimes committed under the age of 18, and Graham extending that uh, in 2010 to life without possibility of parole for non-homicides, to Miller in 2012, which barred mandatory life without possibility of parole for capital offenses committed under the age of 18. And um, one of our panelists actually co-counsel on the follow-up case, Montgomery v. Louisiana, uh, in 2016, in which the US Supreme Court uh, made the application of the Miller case uh, retroactive to the some 2,000 plus folks who were uh, sentenced under mandatory life without possibility of parole. Um, schemes uh, for capital crimes committed as juveniles. But it's taken some time to appreciate the full potential of juvenile justice and in fact the, the, the application of brain science continues to be a challenge at least in part because of the extraordinary developments that continue to come from uh, brain science in that area. And we're only beginning I think to see the infusion of more and more explicit reference to developmental brain science and what we know, uh, it's tandem with adolescent social, uh, cognitive, and emotional developments as they mature. This has led more and more advocates to recognize that uh, to make a more direct and profound impact, we have to figure out a way to effectively communicate about this information. And we need to figure out how to more adequately address the sort of traditional tension between the science, which is largely based on groups, and what the law wants us to do, which is to translate that into its application in individual cases. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about that um, I think pervades the, the challenges, although we can see the brain science being applied in more and more domains of law. I'm pleased today to introduce our extraordinarily accomplished panelists. I will do relatively brief introductions because I think what we would like to do is to spend as much time hearing from them and then talking with you. Um, Marsha Levick is the chief legal officer and co-founder of the Juvenile Law Center. And throughout her career, she has been an advocate for children's and women's rights and is a nationally recognized expert in juvenile law. She oversees the Juvenile Law Center's litigation and appellate docket. Uh, she was uh, a co-author uh, for the uh, Lead Child Advocates uh, amicus briefs in each of the landmark cases that I had mentioned to you um, and was co-counsel, as I mentioned, in the Montgomery v. Uh, Louisiana case. Dr. Leah Somerville is professor of psychology and current director of graduate studies at the Department of Psychology at Harvard University is also the director of the Affective Neuroscience and Developmental Laboratory. She has won multiple uh, career, early career awards for her transformative research and her mentoring. Uh, she is uh, quite uh, a prodigious researcher and her research integrates psychological and neuroscientific approaches to inform how brain development in adolescence shapes psychological changes in adolescent cognitive, motivational, social, and emotional behavior, and informs us of the neural substrates of this maturation process. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Somerville. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here and to stretch my scientific discussions outside of the lab. Um, what I'd like to do in my time today is to sort of frame the discussion um, around sort of what the current state of the science is on adolescent brain and behavioral development, um, to think about what we do know about the way that youth mature and when the timeline along which those maturational processes unfold. Um, I'll mention a little bit about what we might wish we already knew, but maybe don't yet, and then think about some new approaches and sort of new frontiers in developmental neuroscience that might bridge us closer to being able to inform policy relevant issues, um, but also sort of end by sort of asking how much will these new ventures um, bridge the divide. So I'm going to start by giving you a very brief overview of some of the most sort of well understood themes around how the brain develops during adolescence. 
as well as how adolescent behavior or psychological development uh, unfolds and how it looks in decision-making contexts, which may be especially relevant to legally, uh, to decisions around behaviors that may be relevant to criminal acts. So in research, basic research, we often will um, study volunteers who vary in age from childhood to adulthood. These might be community volunteers, and we might ask them to do a number of things for us in the lab, which includes potentially getting a very safe, non-invasive MRI scan. Um, we have an imaging center even just down the street at, um, in the Northwest Building on Harvard's campus, um, in which we have participants, including younger children, adolescents and young adults uh, perform MRI-based brain imaging as well as tasks on computers, questionnaires, interviews, and so on. Using MRI-based technology, we can gain a number of uh, insights into the state of the developing brain. This includes our ability to examine the network pathways or connection pathways of white matter that might be growing and changing throughout Adolescence. This is an image that sort of dissected away everything about the brain except for its connection profile. And these streamlines indicate uh, sort of connections that would link up distant brain structures into brain networks. We can also have structural, look at structural images, which we can then parcelate for um, measuring the volume or different properties of tissue in different brain regions. And this would be considered sort of a gray matter based um, examination of brain development. And I also just want to mention, we've also learned a great deal about brain development using animal models. You might wonder, well, what can a rodent really tell us about human brain development? But it turns out that model systems can be very powerful and helpful in helping us uncover some of the mechanisms of brain development that are hard to access in human volunteers um, in a non-invasive and safe way. So for example, we've learned a great deal about hormonal development uh, based on the common ways that puberty unfolds in rodents and humans. So I'd like to give you some uh, very kind of broad sweeping uh, claims that are very well supported by the science about what do we know about brain development throughout adolescence and when might a brain deem itself mature. Um, I can give you the biggest punchline first, which is that the brain is continuing to develop through adolescence. There's no question about it. No matter how you look, how you slice it, the brain is continuing to develop. We see this in a number of different metrics we can compute about brain development. These are just two, and this is just one example study of many I could have picked. Um, essentially, where every dot is a person, and we see these fit lines indicating the volume of white matter, which are the sort of connection pathways that link up distant brain structures to form brain networks that coordinate their functioning as well. And we see that there is a positive trajectory from age about 5 to 18. This trajectory actually extends well beyond this, this age, um, indicating that white matter or the connection highways that link up distant brain structures are continuing to grow throughout adolescence. And this is thought to be partly dependent on experience. We also can see a shrinkage of gray matter, which are the computation centers or the sort of uh, neuron bodies that would um, uh, compute information. Now, this might seem unfortunate maybe to lose gray matter with development, but in fact, what happens across development is there's a proliferation followed by a pruning of this, uh, this aspect of the brain that's thought to be dependent on experience in which the most used and useful connect uh, neural, neural uh, systems are retained, and anything that's not used or not functioning in an optimal way gets pruned away. So this is sort of sculpting a more efficient brain over age. Now these trajectories don't all unfold along the exact same timeline. Some brain systems tend to undergo their major developmental waves earlier than others. And I want to focus in on the prefrontal cortex, which is one brain area that's of great interest to those of us who are interested in higher cognitive development, development of decision making, reasoning, planning, etc. This region supports all of those higher cognitive functions and others. Um, and if we were to plot its sort of major developmental event, we will see that during adolescence, there's a very strong, uh, pr this pruning process is undergoing very strongly during this age range. In fact, 17% of the overall tissue is pruned away. So this is a pretty substantial biological change. This is thought to sculpt and, um, and specialize the prefrontal cortex for more and more complex cognitive functions. And I also just want to point out with this yellow line that this is the age of 18, which is the age of legal adulthood, of course, in the United States. And you can see that there's a great deal of development that continues on beyond this age, and there's nothing magical 
about the age of 18 from a development or maturity perspective. Now, there are many other insights we've gained into how the brain continues to unfold its developmental course throughout adolescence into early adulthood. And I'll just give you some highlights. We can dig into these in the Q&A if you're interested. In general, there are broad scale increases in brain connectivity, so creating a more coordinated, more efficiently signaling brain at the network level. There's also thought to be temporarily heightened reward responding in the adolescent brain compared to an a uh, child brain and an, an adult brain, which could influence behavioral decision making in a number of ways. And this is in part thought to be supported by alterations in the dopamine system, a neurotransmitter system that signals reward, learning, um, action plans, and the like. An adolescent brain is also becoming a more efficient brain from the perspective of metabolics or the use of energy. So we're sort of sculpting and fine tuning a more efficiently signaling uh, organ. And during adolescence, compared to adulthood, there tends to be more plasticity, that is, for allowing experiences to get under the skin to influence brain development trajectories and psychological outcomes. So in other words, the same kind of experience had during adolescence could exert a stronger impact on shaping brain development than the same event in adulthood. Now, I'd like to switch over for a couple of minutes to talk about behavior. Um, brain and behavior are highly intertwined, and of course, all of the behavioral developments we see during adolescence can be attributed, at least in some way, to brain development. But I want to give you a flavor to some of the ways that we see adolescents um, engaging in decision-making processes using different strategies or weighing information differently than adults do. We tend not to think about adolescent decision-making as worse or faulty compared to adult decision-making, but rather based on sort of different weightings or different uh, values that they hold um, that then ultimately compute sort of rational decisions, but ones that might look different in certain ways than adults. One of these domains is in exploratory behaviors. Um, adolescence, historically, from an evolution perspective, has been a time where individuals start exploring independent actions in the world. And, ex and exploration is an important source of learning to help understand one's environment, the world around them, and sort of how, um, how one can maximize the good outcomes and minimize the bad ones. Now, we've learned a lot about exploratory behaviors and development through, through animal models. So this is an example of a data point from rodents who are confronted with this exploratory context, which is this called an elevated plus maze. So what would happen during this experiment is an animal would be placed in the center of this plus maze. You can see two of the sides have walls covering them, which tend to be preferred by the rodents because they're safer, they're darker. Um, and if animals were exploring this area for food, they typically would prefer the closed parts compared to these kind of scary, uh, risky looking open parts. So we can quantify how much time rodents would spend in the closed arms compared to the open ones, depending on whether they're juvenile, so not yet in the pubertal phase, whether they're in active pubertal development, which is a sort of proxy for animal adolescence, and uh, post-pubertal, which is a proxy for young adulthood. We find that the, um, the pubertal-aged animals tend to spend more time in, choose to spend more time in these open arms, which are avoided by the, both the younger and the older animals to a greater degree. So in other words, a sort of uh, more exploratory or potentially more uh, willing to engage in this sort of more risky exploration compared to the older and younger ages. We can also quantify risk preferences or how people reason about risk um, in studies that use sort of economic style decision making games. We might, uh, for example, have a game where we would show you a possible choice that you could make. So I might ask you all, would you select in to a trial like this where you would have 75% of a chance of winning $20? If I spun this wheel, we could see where it landed. 75% of the time, you'd win $20. But if the wheel landed over here, you would lose $30. So who in the room would be willing to take this gamble versus saying, no thanks, I'll pass? OK, thank you. So we can compare this choice with one that looks a little different, where the odds are essentially the same, but I'm going to amp up the stakes, right? I'm going to make the possible wins greater, the possible losses greater as well. So who in the room would accept this, this risky option? Nobody. OK, great. 
So there's a trick between these two choices, which is that if you were to calculate out the probabilities and the amounts, the value of choosing this wheel is actually equal. But where, what is different is the amount of risk. And we can define risk in a very narrow way here, which is essentially opting into a choice with more variability in the possible outcomes. So the good outcome is really good, the bad outcome is really bad. That amplifies risk. And so this would be a riskier choice to enter into than this one. So there have been dozens of studies now that have tried to quantify adolescent risk preferences or how tolerant they are for risk in their decisions compared to adults. And this is, these are the results of a meta-analysis that basically put all of those sources of data together to ask what are the reliable differences. And we see with a somewhat small difference that adolescents tend to be more willing to accept more risky choices and enter in to these high variability scenarios, variability in terms of the outcome compared to adults. And then finally, I want to um, mention one other factor that seems to be especially relevant for adolescent decision making, which has to do with the context of a decision itself. We could imagine entering in and thinking about risk um, either in a very sort of mathematical and deliberate way. We could play out the odds. We could do some mental math. We could also just trust our gut and go with it, and if, especially if we're excited. So it turns out that adolescents tend to engage in more risky choices when they're in that excited, aroused state compared to adults who are less susceptible to that context. This was done in a study uh, by a collaborator of mine where he had participants do a decision-making game in two different scenarios. The, the game itself was almost the same. He had them, in one case, um, instructed them to reason and think very carefully through the decision they were about to make about risk. And they could have as much time as they wanted. They wouldn't get a lot of feedback. They would just be with their thoughts to make this choice and take as long as they wanted. Under that kind of decision-making context, adolescents and young adults essentially were just as equivalently risky in the choices that they made. So this age difference seemed to disappear. But when we infuse that same decision context with excitement, gave them feedback, positive uh, signals along the way, which made them excited and physiologically aroused, adolescents were, I mean, everyone was more likely to take a risk it take more risk in that context. But our adolescent participants were especially susceptible to, to modify their own risk preference to be more, uh, as more risky than they would otherwise when there's excitement and arousal. So I want to switch to talk about what do we wish we knew. So what, what might we wish neuroscience could give us a clear picture and answer on? One thing that I've spent a lot of time talking and thinking about is that we, as a field of scientists, lack a common definition of when a brain is mature. So you might think, in some alternative reality, that neuroscientists have gotten together and put our thinking caps on and come to a consensus judgment that says, when the brain has this, this, and this property, now we say it's mature. No such luck. <laughs> we do not have a consensus. And this is partly a product of the fact that brain development unfolds along several different trajectories. There isn't just one single growth process, like for height, like a single measurement sums it up. For brain development, there might be dozens or more ways that we could try to make, um, make inferences about when the brain is mature. And in, in truth, all brains are always changing. So saying that the brain stops changing is sort of a misnomer in the first place. So we can do things, though, like try to estimate, OK, maybe we can't know for certain, but what would be like a general guess, right? Maybe we could come to a, um, a range of ages that encompasses most or almost all of brain development. We might do this, and these are just sample data from a different uh, study, um, that where we might be able to identify observations about the brain with each dot being a person, and finding places where we might reach a plateau. Right? If brain development on some metrics are reaching sort of a plateau, we might say, OK, well, this is where all the action is at. And then we pretty much you know, level off. So we can do an analysis like this of a variety of different metrics about brain development and ask whether this plateau point is more or less at the same age or whether it varies a lot. And I looked at this a few years ago by looking at a few different metrics of brain development, which I'm not going to go into detail on, as well as a few different aspects of the brain, different lobes, for example, or summing over the whole brain. And each of these gray dots would be the estimated point where this sort of steady state is reached. 
And we can see that there's a wide variability in the age of reaching those endpoints, those, those plateau points. As young as maybe 20 years old for some brain systems, but perhaps for other measurements and other parts of the brain, extending all the way up into the 30s. So this is a bit inconvenient for policy, <laughs> to say the least, um, and we can unpack that in more depth. Um, but it, it doesn't give us a very sure footing of like saying sort of the brain is mature when these conditions are reached. It's somewhat of a moving target depending on what we're looking at and where we're looking. And if we said, okay, well, we'll wait till the final trajectory is complete, we might be up in the 30s. So what do we do about that? Another um, thing I think we wish that we knew is um, that we wish we had better tools to take what we've learned in the lab, which tends to be about groups of people, and try to take that and apply to an individual case. So I've, I just showed you, these are sample, oops, sorry. These are sample data I'm about to bring back up on the screen. But naturally, data don't fit on a perfect line. They are a cloud. Humans are wildly variable <laughs> in just about every way that psychologists and neuroscientists measure them. So um, if we were to say, so we can identify very nicely maybe curves that fit most of the variance or that explain groups of people in a general sense, but what could we could say about one single individual person is uh, a bigger challenge for science. For example, if, I, if this curve produces a plateau, like around age 17.2, well, we have some individuals who reached that point at already at age 10, and we had other individuals who still have not yet reached that point at age 25. That's just an example of the variability we naturally deal with in measurements about people. And so we sometimes discuss this problem called the G to I problem, the group to individual, trying to make inferences from a group and apply them to an individual. So if I were, for example, in a legal context to be having a single person that I was trying to make a determination about maturity or something, I might have a very difficult time saying anything about that specific person besides how they, and be, without referring to just um, sort of averages that science generally depends on. And just a real kind of real life example of this is the drinking age was, um, was changed, right, in the 20th century up to 21 because a lot of 18 to 21 year olds were abusing alcohol and creating uh, problems with driving. But are some 18 year olds ready to drink responsibly? Sure, of course, right? So, but these kind of averages um, don't necessarily capture individuals. And this is something that's very fundamental to science. The final thing I think we wish we would have known, or we wish knew, we knew better, is that scientific evidence about brain development has been skewed towards studying certain demographic groups, which leads us with some gaps of knowledge of um, other, other groups that are less convenient in one way or another to study. So most science, uh, neuroscience happens at, um, in cities that have major universities that might have certain demographic groups that live closer to universities, making it more feasible for them to participate or belonging to families who might have free time or interest or the ability to um, spend time participating in research. This creates natural biases in who our science comes to represent in the answers we get. So this has been come of more and more on the radar of scientists, and we are doing a lot of things about this to have more representative uh, samples that represent youth in the United States more broadly. But I just want to show you one data point to say that it matters, that brain development metrics do depend on the group who you are studying. So there was a very clever analysis that was done on a data set of about 500 kids of varying demographic and socioeconomic groups, but they were underrepresented in certain demographic bins, if you will. So you can conduct a sort of mathematical rebalancing at the, and when you do the data analysis to upweight individuals who are represented less in the data and downweight individuals who are overrepresented to basically do a mathematical correction, if you will. And this is obviously not perfect, but the question would be, well, does it matter? Would I get the same answer about brain development trajectories if I reweighted or if I didn't? And I just want to give you one snippet of data without explaining it in too much detail. These are the age-related trajectories for the reduction, that pruning process of gray matter, in a sample that was used the normal way and one that was reweighted. And you can see that those trajectories do differ. And this tells us as scientists that 
Who we study matters, and the representativeness does influence the answer we get. So in the last couple of minutes I have, I just want to sort of give a glimpse into some new scientific efforts and agendas that might help us get closer to characterizing brain development in a way that might be translatable with greater ease. For one, the scientists um, have become more and more interested in contextual effects, that is thinking about brain development not as one single static thing, but instead thinking about it as a, um, a there could be a range of uh, developmental levels depending on the context that that brain is in. For example, um, a, one study, and this is a bit of a technical study, I'm going to gloss over almost every single detail, so please forgive me. Um, but essentially what the study wanted to do was to develop a mathematical algorithm to try and predict how old a person was based on some metrics about their brain. And I'm going to gloss over every detail besides that. And scientists can do this with some degree of accuracy. Um, and, we, and the scientists in this study did it first in a neutral context. And this black line indicates how well they could predict how old a person was, depending on um, how pre the predictions here, and then comparing it against how old they actually were. Now, the interesting part is that they took this mathematical algorithm and, and then had the participants do two other types of scans. One in a sort of threat context where they were being threatened with an electric shock, or actually, no, the delivery of a loud noise. Um, so this was a little bit of an anxious context. And we could compare, well, what would be the, how well would these predictions do under this emotional context, and separately in a reward context where people are waiting to win money. And to, just to jump to the major punchline, um, the adolescent, great, this, this zero point is sort of what the age was at, in, at neutral, but the adolescent brain showed itself in this algorithm, at least, to be a younger a, according uh, in the negative and positive context compared to its own age prediction in the neutral context. This tells us that even the idea of predicting one single age from the brain might depend on what context that brain is in. And that the adolescent brain might be especially susceptible to emotional conditions, more so than other ages, which are a closer, maybe, match to the, to the neutral point. Now, finally, we also are in um, the NIH, I should say, is investing a great deal of resources in creating larger, more representative scientific studies of brain development. And this is major for us in the field, because what it means is that we can get very definitive answers about even basic sort of growth curves of different aspects of brain development. And we can invest the time and money needed to make those studies representative of youth and avoid that problem of those um, of limited uh, sample uh, representation. One such study is called the ABCD study, which is, I think, in about its third year. That's actually being done in 21 cities across the United States. Uh, Boston is not one of them. <laughs> Usually, we tend to be in these consortia, but this, this one not. And the thing that's special about this study is it's the largest study of brain development and child health that's ever been done. Um, it's ongoing. They, this group enrolled 11,878 youth. And they enrolled them at age 9 and 10. And they're going to follow them for 10 years to, as they grow up to late adolescence. And they're going to check in on them every year and image their brain every other year to basically develop growth curves for individual kids and can examine how those growth curves change as a product of a number of different kinds of experiences and exposures. This study was very strict in adhering to the demographic makeup of the United States. So they also had a very epidemiologically informed um, uh, enrollment strategy so that the kids in this study are basically a cross-section of youth in the United States today, not just those ones that are convenient to test. This study will be done in about seven years, so you'll have to wait a little while to know the primary results. <laughs> There's another large representative study that's dear to my heart called the Human Connectome Project in Development, which is a study that is um, happening at Harvard in my re with my research team. Um, this is a comprehensive study focused on brain connectivity, so how the connections of the brain uh, wire up and specialize during adolescence and childhood. This study is a modest 1,300 participants, although we're very proud of that number. Um, and its demographics largely, but not quite as strictly, mirror the population of young people. 
So what might these large studies do, offer to the field for translating to other issues? Well, I think we'll get a finer grained picture of what brain development looks like in the first place that's more accurate and more reflective of youth in general. So providing a clearer scientific picture. The size of these studies also let us look at complex interactions, for example, of environmental experiences that might hit an individual at a different point in development to see what kind of different impact it might have depending on the stage of the person. So I think that these studies offer promise in bringing a clearer picture of what, the brain, what brain development really looks like in its complexity. It will also better reflect a range of demographics and backgrounds. But I think that there are questions that remain. If we got this intricate, more comprehensive picture, what do we do with that? Does this, does this solve some of, the the, some of the translation problem to ethical issues? And I think that I'll just lead, end with two questions that I hope we can discuss today, which is, OK, we got this intricate look. How should that information be used within a legal decision-making context? And by almost any biological or psychological metric, the age of 18 um, is not the end of development. <laughs> um, and it, then, in fact, it's ongoing in almost every uh, metric we look at. So how does that inform the general concept of maturity, which in our society is yoked to the age of 18? So I don't have the answer to those questions today, but I'm looking forward to engaging in them and others. And thank you all for your time. Good afternoon. So I think one of the most interesting things about Leah's comments, and thank you for that, and for that great build up to whatever it is that I'm going to say here, is that actually what your remarks prove is that we're in the middle of the story in terms of the science. But we are very far along in the story in terms of the law. And so part of me as a legal advocate here listening to you of course is now anxious, because what if the story changes? <laughs> and then what do we do? So I'm gonna try to respond to that in real time. And in doing that, to also just put this science in a legal context in terms of where we are now, and then talk a bit about where I think we might be going, and then we're actually really anxious to have questions and comments from you in the audience. So in terms of the backdrop, and where we are now. I think that um, Robert's opening comment about how is it that advocates can most effectively translate and communicate this scientific, scientific information is a really important question for us to consider. And I think it's something that I, as an advocate, am thinking about all the time and not sure that I have the right answers. And ultimately, the question that we're posing to ourselves, and I think the question that Leah really posed through her presentation, was what is the relevance of all of this scientific information to the law? How is it relevant to legal arguments or legal principles that we are either trying to articulate or in some respects have already articulated and what is the meaning going forward of all of that? I wanna talk briefly about the Eighth Amendment cases that the Supreme Court has decided with this great scientific um, backdrop behind us uh, about one case that addressed kids in the juvenile justice system around interrogation issues and then bring us forward and talk about what I think the issues are that we are going to confront today and in the future. The science that the Supreme Court was presented with in Roper in 2005 importantly was incredibly nascent with respect to the neuroscience. And I also add importantly, not even mentioned in the Supreme Court's decision in Roper. Neuroscience was not a part of that case. That was only 15 years ago. That's not very long ago in um, Supreme Court case law years. And I mention that to underscore that all of this developmental framework that we have been successfully pursuing in the courts has been a combination of really behavioral science, the kind of soft psychological research, developmental research, and neuroscience. The doctors kind of versus the psychologists, the medical doctors versus the psychologists um, who won't sign each other's briefs, so we know that they don't necessarily think they're all talking the same language. And Roper was premised, as I said, really on behavioral science, the developmental science, and yet Roper provided a framework 
for all of the Supreme Court decisions going forward that hasn't changed. It has embedded and embraced the neuroscience, but it hasn't moved forward from that original framework that it identified. And that framework in Roper had three components to it. The court essentially found, based on the developmental research, that there were three attributes of adolescence that mattered in terms of constitutional analysis under the Eighth Amendment again. And that was a determination or a finding, a constitutional finding, that children are developmentally immature, which means that they are immature in their judgment and decision-making capacities. Secondly, that they have a particular susceptibility to peer influence generally, and we all know that, we all know as adolescents that we rarely went anywhere by ourselves, rarely did anything by ourselves, but also a particular susceptibility to negative peer influences. And then thirdly, of course, we all move through adolescence. We all get to the other side, and so adolescence is a transitory period that allows for growth, for change, and importantly, in the context of Supreme Court decision-making, this capacity for rehabilitation and transformation. So that all came out of the developmental science. And why did that matter in the context of sentencing under the Eighth Amendment? Because what the court was looking at when confronted with a challenge to the death penalty in 2005 was the question of proportionality under the Eighth Amendment. The court has not always strongly focused on the proportionality aspect of the Eighth Amendment. But beginning with Roper, I would say in the sort of new iteration of how it has thought about the Eighth Amendment, it really put proportionality front and center and identified concerns for proportionality of sentencing as being the core component of the Eighth Amendment. Disproportionality being a core violation of the Eighth Amendment. And the court looked at these three criteria of adolescence, these three characteristics of adolescence, immaturity of judgment, susceptibility to negative peer influence, capacity for change, as altering, if you kind of think about the calculus of how we decide culpability and blameworthiness, as altering that calculus and making kids less blameworthy for their conduct in our criminal justice system and how we think about criminal responsibility. And if they were suddenly deemed less blameworthy in a constitutional universe in which proportionality dominates our thinking about what is a permissible sentence for an individual, then we have to take a step back from the most extreme sentencing. And that's what the court did in Roper. The court essentially said kids apparently are not the worst of the worst because they are less blameworthy by virtue of these adolescent characteristics, and we can't impose the most extreme sentencing on them, which was the death penalty. So the court strikes the death penalty. It does it categorically. It doesn't allow for the possibility that jurors can make individual determinations based on mitigation presented in an individual case. Categorical, anyone under the age of 18 is no longer eligible for the death penalty. In 2010, five years later, when the court was presented with a challenge to life without parole for juveniles, young people under the age of 18 convicted of non-homicide crimes, the court introduces neuroscience. So five years later, suddenly neuroscience is what it's all about, and the court looks at the neuroscientific information presented to it through amicus briefs. All of this information is coming to the court through amicus briefs, not through factual records being developed at the trial level. For all the lawyers in the room and judges, that is an incredibly important and interesting point. Coming to the court in the first instance before the US Supreme Court, and the court says the neuroscience just confirms what we already knew from the developmental research. It, in fact, makes it stronger. It takes us a little further down the road of certainty. And so we're going to, again, make another categorical determination about life without parole. Life without parole is really like the death penalty. One way or another, you are sentenced to die in prison. That is, I mean, that is true. It may come later, not sooner. Uh, but children will die in prison. And so the court struck the death penalty categorically for any youth under the age of 18 who was convicted of a non-homicide crime. When the court comes to a challenge to mandatory life without parole in Miller versus Alabama in 2012, it's confronted with a slightly different set of considerations. 
The science hasn't changed, obviously. The court is still reciting the same three developmental features of adolescence as the foundation for its Eighth Amendment jurisprudence and how it is re-examining extreme sentencing. But in Miller, it was confronted with a mandatory sentence, a mandatory sentence of life without parole in homicide cases in many jurisdictions across the country, over 30 jurisdictions across the country, which put the court in the position of having to not only think about whether or not this particular sentence was proportionate to someone who committed homicide, but also whether or not one could remove the individual consideration that is also part and parcel of the Supreme Court's death penalty jurisprudence. So the court in Miller is again melding these two worlds of death penalty and life without parole and confronting them really head on in Miller where the court has to say, we know that life without parole is an extreme sentence and definitely not permissible at all, disproportionate in every instance for youth under 18 who commit non-homicide crimes. We know that in our death penalty jurisprudence, because the court ruled this in the 1970s, that we cannot have mandatory capital punishment in this country. Such an extreme sentence, such a final sentence, can't be imposed without allowing for the fullest consideration of individual attributes and mitigating qualities. Put them together and said that in the context of life without parole for youth, who are categorically less culpable than adults, we're going to both ban mandatory sentencing, require this individual consideration, but allow for the possibility that you still might have a life without parole sentence imposed on a youth convicted of homicide if you could put the right individual story together. This is from the state's perspective. If the state could put the right individual story together to justify the imposition of life without parole as a proportionate sentence under the Eighth Amendment. In between Miller and Graham, Graham is 2010, Miller is 2012, the court decided another case, JDB versus North Carolina, which I want to mention because it's not a sentencing case, and yet it fully embraced the science in a slightly different way. I hope you're like not all walking out because you're like so like not interested. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I get it. Um, in, in JDB, the court was confronted with a challenge to uh, the application of the Miranda rule. Everybody knows the Miranda rule, obviously, uh, to children and whether or not we could have the same standard of reasonableness when police should be expected to issue the Miranda warnings to children when would they be likely to think that they were unable to terminate an interrogation, that they would feel that they were in custody, such that the Miranda warnings had to be administered, that that was triggered. And while the court talked about the science, again, this is after Roper, this is after, after Graham, the court talked about the developmental characteristics of adolescence, the same three issues. I think the court also did something else, which was the court really melded here civil law and criminal law. Because in civil tort law, the court has always had a reasonable person standard, and the court has acknowledged the reasonable child in tort law, that there could be circumstances under which one would be assessing or evaluating the liability of a young person in civil tort law where you actually would think about what the reasonable child would look like. The court took that concept and for the first time in American criminal legal history applied it in a criminal justice context, in this case juvenile justice, and essentially determined that we could have a reasonable child in criminal law, just as we could have a reasonable adult in criminal law, which is what we have in criminal law. The concept of reasonableness and reasonable person drives much of how we ascribe liability in the criminal justice system. And it also was relevant, of course, in the context of Miranda warnings, because what would a reasonable person think? How would they evaluate their situation vis-a-vis -vis law enforcement and their interaction with law enforcement? And so the court adopts a new standard, this concept of the reasonable child in juvenile court for the purposes of, uh, purposes of police interrogation. And arguably, <laughs> arguably, this is part of the what, what do we do going forward, gave us another way of thinking about children in the justice system. And so, so the first point that I want to make here is that although we have been very focused on sentencing 
and I, when I say we, I'm speaking as advocates, as lawyers doing this work, we have been very focused on sentencing and really struggling with what does it mean to prosecute, convict, and sentence children, particularly in the criminal justice system. In what ways does neuroscience, developmental science, influence and inform that decision? In what ways do those scientific findings compel specific determinations? But it turns out that there is also room for a second question, which is in what ways does all of this information, do all of these facts about youth and adolescence matter with respect to how we think about children in our justice system generally? Are there other ways in which we might actually need to reevaluate how we think again about criminal responsibility, criminal liability, which is in and of itself a whole really interesting conversation and lots to um, unpack there. But, but starting from there, let me talk about where we, have, where we are today in terms of where the research is taking us. So the important takeaway, I think, from Leah's presentation is how fluid the science is. That although the Supreme Court really drew the line at 18, and to be fair or clear or both, the court drew the line at 18 partly because that's what we asked for as advocates. We wanted that line drawn at 18. We chose 18 because most of the United States for the last meaningful period has accepted 18 as the age of majority, as the age of maturity. I say that, and yet I also want to say, well, not really. <laughs> Because the other thing that has happened in the, certainly in the last decade, and maybe even going back more than that, is that that age of maturity keeps moving up. So you have to be 21 to buy alcohol. You have to be 21 to buy cigarettes. You have to be 21 to get tattoos in a lot of jurisdictions. There are all kinds of restrictions on entry into traditional pathways of adulthood in the United States that are limited not just to youth under the age of 18, but increasingly to youth, young adults, emerging adults who are 21 or under the age of 21. But there are also benefits that we have now extended through state law and federal law, I would add, to youth over the age of 18. So for example, everybody remember Obamacare? <laughs> Obamacare kept children, still does obviously, keeps children on their parents' insurance until age 26. Why? What, why, why did Congress do that? Why was that part of the legislation? I'm not asking you to answer, but we can assume it was because of some very strongly felt view, supported view, that kids young adults up through age 25 or 26 probably really weren't able to be financially independent under a number of really obvious scenarios that we can all think of. And some of you in this room may yourselves experience. But it wasn't just Obamacare. Foster care benefits, the ability to stay in the foster care system and to benefit from the supportive services that our child welfare system can provide to young adults has now been extended through federal law and in most states up through age 21. Federal legislation passed last year under the Trump administration has extended certain educational benefits and other child welfare supports up to young adults up through age 23. So there is this curious, but I would argue scientifically rooted appreciation across the board in this country, in a variety of arenas, that kids don't magically become adults at the age of 18. And yet, we are working against this very rigid system that has been created so far by the US Supreme Court that has really drawn that line at 18. And let me say a, a couple of other things. So, so the line at 18, I do want to be clear in how the Supreme Court articulated its Eighth Amendment reasoning. I talked about the issue of proportionality and how central that was to the court's striking of these sentences. The reason why the court made categorical rules and rejected the idea of individual decision-making in the context of the death penalty 
and life without parole in non-homicide cases was because of this risk of error. So the court adopted the categorical, the group to individual, which I thought was so important about Leah's presentation. That is something that will probably plague us for an unknown number of years going forward. This, this struggle of the group to individual about whether or not we can tolerate an individual analysis or we must accept a group analysis. And to, up to this point, the court has been mostly in favor of this categorical group representation. Again, because the risk of error is too great in thinking about proportionality of sentencing, that we need to err on the side of perhaps allowing some people to get a sentence that might be proportionate for them individually, because too many will get a sentence that is disproportionate under the Eighth Amendment. Going forward, what has happened since Montgomery was ruled retroactive, and since Miller came down, and since the science, as it continues to do its science <laughs> and its research, as it pushes that boundary, and the boundary at 18 increasingly gets fuzzier and fuzzier. It hasn't been completely obliterated, but it's, it's like we're, it's charcoal and we're kind of smearing it out. Is that not surprisingly, the lawyers in the room <laughs> have said, I think I can apply these cases to an older population. And if the court relied upon these scientific findings that were premised on these characteristics of adolescence that themselves portrayed immaturity, that itself suggested reduced blameworthiness, if all that stuff is still going on in emerging adults, young adults over the age of 18, why don't we just extend those cases and those rulings to individuals over the age of 18. And so that is being done, <laughs> not very successfully. And the reason why I think it is not being done very successfully in part is for a very legalistic reason, which is that a lot of these cases are coming up in the post-conviction context, meaning that lawyers are asking courts to read into Miller and Montgomery a determination that already says everybody over the age of 18 is just like everybody under the age of 18. And if that's, if that's true, you would extend those cases if it's not really very clear from the text of the court's decision in Miller or even in Graham, it's much harder to say those cases dictate or compel the same legal reasoning and the same legal outcome for individuals over the age of 18. The other ways in which the science is being used, however, is not strictly in this kind of just apples to apples, Miller, Graham, Roper, and all of these challenges are in the courts right now. There are challenges all over the country right now trying to extend bans on the death penalty, bans on life without parole to individuals over the age of 18. There have been a couple of victories. There was a victory in Connecticut, in the Connecticut Federal District Court, which is now up on appeal before the Second Circuit, post-conviction. So I think it's very challenging to win in the Second Circuit. Uh, there was a victory in the trial court, criminal court in Kentucky that is on appeal before the Kentucky Supreme Court has actually been there for quite a while, and the Kentucky Supreme Court hasn't hasn't issued an opinion in that case yet. Um, but we're seeing it come up in other ways. Uh, so for example, in Washington State, the Washington State Supreme Court was confronted with a challenge to adult sentencing of someone over the age of 18, but literally just over the age of 18, and asked to address whether or not under the Washington State sentencing scheme, considerations of youth, albeit not exactly the youth under the age of 18, but the characteristics of young adults that were now supported by the emerging science, whether that could be, should be, not could be, should be relevant in sentencing an adult under the Washington State sentencing statutes. The Washington State Supreme Court, which has been, I would argue, very out front on a lot of these issues across the board, and I'm gonna talk about another Washington State case, said yes, that based on the science, based on the, continuing scientific research that is being done and the literature that is being made available to all of us, that youth, even for someone over the age of 18, was a relevant factor, a compelling factor for someone 
under Washington State sentencing laws. Washington State did something else that was quite interesting. Washington State took Miller's ban on mandatory sentencing and the requirement for individualized determinations. And in a case in which they were asked to consider the constitutionality of Washington State's mandatory sentencing laws for youth in the adult system, but not extreme sentencing, not life without parole. They were mandatory firearm enhancements of five years, recommended sentencing ranges and everything obviously short of murder, below murder, that were anywhere they could be measured in months or they could be measured in years, and whether or not criminal courts, so adult sentencing courts, were required to apply those same mandatory or recommended sentencing ranges for children under the age of 18 but who had been appropriately, properly prosecuted in criminal court in Washington State, the Washington State Supreme Court said no. Not only said no, but said you cannot apply our mandatory criminal sentencing statutes to a child, even if they end up in our criminal court that you have to follow the mandate of Miller around this idea of individualized sentencing and allow for any sentence at all, literally from zero, from probation, to whatever you think is the appropriate period of custody, but banned the use of any mandatory sentencing scheme for children in the adult system. Iowa issued a similar decision. Uh, there have been a couple of other courts that have done that. So that's another way in which we have seen the extension of the science in these cases. Uh, Judge Gertner and I have been involved in a couple of efforts to extend, in a way, the reasoning of JDB to felony murder. And felony murder, of course, is this notion of transferred intent, the idea that if you have the intent to commit an underlying felony, we can assume that if a murder happened in the context, in the course of the commission of that felony, it's appropriate to transfer your intent to that, to the commission of the homicide. Why? because the reasonable person would have foreseen that that murder would occur under the circumstances of the felony murder doctrine. We have argued, based on the science, that the notion of foreseeability for a child is different than it is for an adult. That the perception of risk, which Leah's research and the slides that she had up there identified, the perception of risk is different. The appreciation of risk is different. Um, you know, that little mouse is willing to walk out on that skinny little <laughs> ramp there, um, not realizing that he or she is going to fall off of it. And in, in many ways, that's the argument about felony murder, that you have young individuals who are participating in crimes that unfortunately lead to the death of a victim, that, that it may not be appropriate to ascribe that level of foreseeability and understanding and appreciation to that individual. They have also been challenging, <laughs> and I would say we have not won those yet. Um, and yet I think they're, they are appropriate, they are reasonable extensions of where the science is going. Let me conclude because I want to make sure we have time for questions. I want to sort of react to Leah's last two slides about the ongoing research that is trying to account for, I think, both duration, how long are we following individuals, trying to account for whether or not our samples were appropriately representative, addressing this sort of group to individual uh, issue that is absolutely present in all this research. Um, there, it raises the question of whether or not the science will change on us. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a fair question for us to mull. We, I guess we won't know for seven or ten years, um, and by then who knows what the court will look like. Um, but but I, I think it's important to, I, I feel as a lawyer, you know, as advocates, we need to be mindful of that, because the curious thing to me about the Supreme Court cases is how they have almost converted the scientific facts into constitutional principles. And so, and I say that because I think when lawyers now go and litigate the offshoots of Roper and Graham and Miller and JDB, they're not really presenting a whole lot of science all the time. Some of that litigation is premised on, we've already decided this one. We're not going to relitigate whether kids are different. The court said they are, 
that it was a constitutional principle, and that it compelled specific and very different constitutional outcomes for children. If the science changes on us, we will have to confront that. <laughs> I think I'll leave it there. While we're making the transition, uh, Marsha, I, I have a question for you uh, that I've been puzzled about for a time. Um, it seems that in Roper, um, although they didn't make it as one of the primary points it's alluded to, the difficulty of looking at somebody in mid-adolescence and being able to predict, as w would be required in a capital case, that they would continue to be uh, violent and be beyond rehabilitation. Um, and so that becomes kind of a good reason for the categoricals. We, can't, we don't have the science to look at somebody in mid-adolescence and say, yeah, that's one of them. And the risk of error, too high. Uh, by the time we get to Miller, he seemed to have stepped back from the categorical and say, you have to make an individualized determination, something on the order of irretrievably depraved, having just said in Roper, we don't know how to do that. Um, and there was another little sort of sleight of hand that I thought I saw in the constitutional um, reasoning on this. In Miller, they point out that you can't look at the characteristics of the crime itself in order to, no matter how heinous, in order to predict uh, the, the, a use course of potential rehabilitation. That turns out to be scientifically true. Uh, but then in Montgomery, they seem to instruct the court to look to the characteristics of the crime in order to help decide whether or not this youth is irretrievably depraved for purposes of sentencing to life without possibility of parole. Am I missing something, or was that really kind of <laughs> constitutional sleight of hand? So that's quite a muddle that you've described. Um, and it has been a muddle, I think, for um, certainly for lawyers going forward in trying to address these cases. So let me um, try to address each of these. First of all, with, this, with respect to the issue of offense versus offender, and you're right that certainly in Roper and in Graham, the court was really fixated on offender and not the offense, and that it was the characteristics of the offender that mattered. That is premised, of course, on a lot of capital jurisprudence where there are cases where the court has said in capital cases the heinousness of the crime cannot in and of itself justify the imposition of the death penalty, and the court has accurately and I think appropriately observed all murder is heinous. Um, certainly there are aggravating factors, but the, the crime itself is not the thing that would justify the imposition of the death penalty. And for the most part, courts have acknowledged that. I think that principle looms large in the resentencing cases, and yet I can tell you every day, if there is a resentencing going on anywhere in the country right now, there is a trial judge who is obsessing over the circumstances of the offense, and very likely to impose either life without parole again or a very extended period of years because they can't get past the offense. And that has given us a lot of work to do at the appellate stage to try to remind appellate judges that that's actually not what Miller said. Um, the other point with respect to this notion of, uh, it's almost like prevention of dangerousness, which was a very big thing back in the 70s, and then it seemed like we got away from it. Um, and I think it's returning into our thinking and our jurisprudence again right now. The, the court in Miller uh, was was con concerned, again, about this idea of proportionality and so seemed to set a very high bar of permanent incorrigibility, irretrievable depravity, irredeemable corruption, um, all of which sound like things that I think most psychologists would say, I don't even know how to say you are that. How do we define that? And yet, somehow courts have to be able to do that. And so courts have been confronted also with this question of what is it that would be relevant to making that determination? And do we make that determination in resentencing cases, for example, by going back to 1992 when the offense was committed and who was this individual in 1992? Or can we appropriately consider who has this individual become as we resentence them today in February 2020? To me, the answer is really obvious, but again, there's a sentencing going on right now somewhere in the country where it's not obvious. <laughs> the reason why I say it's obvious is because the notion of permanent incorrigibility is that that is a static condition. It doesn't change. It is permanent. You cannot prove that something is permanent or impermanent unless you examine it over a period of time. So that in and of itself, to me, compels this Look, look forward backwards. We're looking backwards, but we're expanding 
the, the window through which we are examining an individual's conduct and behavior and, and persona in prison. But the other point that I would make is that if you go back to Graham, which was the decision where the court actually set out the framework that you had to allow for parole eligibility for someone who was sentenced to life without parole, that, that the reason for that parole eligibility was because of the court's belief, based on the science, that you had to give individuals the opportunity to demonstrate this growth and maturity, this capacity for change that they didn't have as teenagers. Well, how do you demonstrate that if you don't let someone demonstrate that? And you can only demonstrate it by examining who was the individual that they have become over time. So on the ground in the courts, it's been incredibly challenging at the trial level to turn these lofty principles into real life driving rules, I would say. But I think the rules are, until the science changes, I think the rules are absolutely not only valid in terms of the science, but I think require a very specific approach, which is to be much more flexible than what you've described. Um, we'll go to you, and then we'll go to Judge Good. Yes, come up to the microphone, please. So my question is, as we move towards this idea of youth being categorically less culpable, do we match that with more responsibility for adults and communities? And does the science sort of ask us to reimagine a more holistic kind of accountability? Answer from the science perspective. OK. <laughs> well, I guess also dovetailing with what you just mentioned about giving people a chance to basically grow into maturity, and could we predict what that looks like? Um, I mean, scientists think that development unfolds not only as a product of like biologically governed processes, but also very much also a product of the experiences and learning opportunities that people take in. Um, so it, this does give a lot of potential for change um, in youth as they mature. Um, it also gives the chance for negative environments to exert inf influence as well, which I think incarcerated environments might be an example of one we could consider in that way. Um, but getting to your question about a more sort of holistic picture, I think the more we understand the drivers of development, so what are the, the inputs or like the kickstarters of different developmental change processes, the more we realize that they're really complicated. And so um, accounting for a person's sort of ultimate way a person turns into an adult <laughs> um, is a process that unfolds and is a product of many, the accumulation of many, many factors. Um, and how that actually would translate into a legal decision, I, I would have to defer to others. But I think from a scientific standpoint, uh, people are considering development with more nuance than had ever before. And, and I think on the legal side that over the last 20, 30 years, our legal system, criminal justice system, has not been particularly nuanced. And <laughs> I know you agree. <laughs> that was kind of perfect. <laughs> um, you know, I think that the really coming off of obviously the 80s and 90s and the rise in violent crime, which was real, um, the imposition of so much mandatory sentencing and federal guidelines has just taken all the nuance away and has treated everybody categorically in, in different ways, in bad ways, not in positive ways. And what, what I think some of the legal outcomes that have happened with respect to kids in the justice system has done is that it, it, is, it, it has a little bit of um, sort of melding into the criminal justice system. So we're in a moment right now where there's an enormous amount of energy for criminal justice reform. And there are a lot of reasons for that. It's not just about science, obviously. There are a lot of economic drivers for that and other things that are going on. Our system is inherently built on retribution and punishment. So if, we, if there are cracks in that wall, and those cracks came in the juvenile justice space, or really came in the criminal justice space involving kids in the criminal justice system, if there was an opening to examine whether or not all that retribution could be justified or was even worth it in terms of public safety, I do think that's one of the things, not the only, it's one of the things that is also informing this conversation in the criminal justice system generally, in that space generally, that is examining lots of things about business as usual in the criminal justice space. We'll see how long that lasts, but we're in that moment right now. Judge Gardner, since we're filming, if you'd step up to the microphone. And as you do that, I would, I would just observe that um, 
as I understand it, in Finland, it's not possible to prosecute anybody under the age of 18 for misconduct because it's viewed not as an individual problem, but as a community problem to be solved as a community. Interesting. Um, part of the problem is that there is no theory of proportionality in ordinary sentencing. In other words, we have never, the right. Supreme Court that threw out death penalty for juveniles and threw out mandatory life without parole for juveniles has been unable to say that getting a 25-year term on three strikes you're out is, is wrong. Right. So once you got away from sort of the spigot, the categorical death penalty, no, lot, mandatory life, no, into the range of ordinary sentencing, the ambiguity of ordinary sentencing came through. And that, I think, is what we're confronting in all of the, all of the resentencings. The only other comment I'd want to make about Leah is that I would love to see research on the melding of juvenile neuroscience and adversity because virtually all of the 18 to 27 year olds that I sentenced uh, came from communities that were horrific. Um, and how the two could work together is an open question. And is there research on that? And can yeah. you do it now? <laughs> <laughs> There's research on one piece of it, which is the further you penetrate into the juvenile justice and the adult criminal justice system, the higher the adversity exposures have been in childhood. That's not even controversial anymore. Mm -hmm. If any of you have done research or been able to meld the neurobiology of trauma, and this really feeds on Judge Gertner's comment, I've spent 40 years working with extremely traumatized youth and adults, and sometimes judges will let me get in some of that, but I'm a lawyer, and they would say, Ms. Poole, when did you get a degree in psychology? Uh, I didn't, but I can't get an expert to come in and testify. So I'm wondering if any of this could now be used uh, perhaps to mandate training for all police, probation, judges, and at least to require that they allow me to make some of these arguments to hand in Professor Somerville's uh, research, certainly the research on ACEs, the adverse child experiences. Sometimes judges would let us do that, um, but as you've pointed out, it's so dependent on individuals. Okay. Leah, yeah, I mean, there's actually quite a uh, in a fascinating wave of research that research and energy toward research about the impacts of experience on brain development, broadly speaking, which includes experience of adversity, experiences of trauma. Um, I can shout out a couple of themes that I'm seeing in that research, um, although I don't do it myself. Um, there, a lot of that research, by the way, is happening at Harvard um, in my same department. Um, my colleague, Professor Kate McLaughlin's lab, studies the impacts of experience on brain development. Um, a couple of things to mention of uh, the themes emerging is certainly experience, ex the, the way people often describe it is early experiences get under the skin and they exert permanently altering impacts on brain development. That is, the plasticity during development is high. That means you're receptive to experiences, both for better and for worse. And unfortunately, negative experiences can really get under the skin and exert a strong impact on brain development, mental health, um, and a number of cognitive and emotional outcomes. Um, and this is, the, the story becomes complicated when we think about what kinds of experiences what kinds of impacts and at what timing would those impacts exert a bigger influence than others? So there's research on all of those things. Um, I can tell you the, the big theme is that they really do matter. <laughs> um, they matter at the behavioral level and at the neurobiological level. And Please. with respect to trauma, in the resentencing cases, I think that there is much attention paid to issues of childhood trauma. Um, certainly with lawyers who are working with mitigators who have an appreciation for that research, you're seeing it introduced, uh, I think, all the time. It's difficult to assess what bearing that has on the whole story that is being told in those cases. Um, but I think because of all the work around races, ACEs and the other research that's been done, it, it's, it's in the air and people know about it and people are trying to utilize it more. But I think especially in that space, in that resentencing space, we're seeing it. I feel teed up to uh, ask whether or not it isn't time to have a, a reasonable adult standard uh, for juvenile justice system stakeholders. Um, 
the notion that a, a reasonable juvenile justice system stakeholder, be it a police officer, a judge, a probation officer, a prosecutor, um, a defense attorney, understand that kids are different seems to be something we just cannot imprint on this system in the United States. Um, and I mentioned this after just doing a study for Strategies for Youth of um, how many states now have required officers to be trained before they start working in a public school. And it's only 21 states that have done so, 29 don't. And of the curriculum that we're able to find in those 21 states, only nine even request any uh, discussion of trauma. And we know what an impact trauma has on kids being able to be educated. But of particular concern, and I'm wondering if anyone has worked on this or would volunteer, I'm working with some attorneys to develop um, basically an argument for what a reasonable police officer should know. And this was actually discussed in Haley versus Ohio in 1948. But I'm beginning to think it would make sense if we could argue that um, a reasonable police officer, officer should know that kids are different from adults, because they don't, and their policies don't often require that, and that they should be using force and have different expectations um, of their interactions impacts with youth. And I'm wondering if anyone else has uh, tried to uh, articulate this reasonable stakeholder argument and integrate the JDB and Roper assumptions because when you see police misconduct cases in which the child is a plaintiff, you don't see lawyers raising those points. And that's what we're trying to do with this, what a reasonable officer should know. Yeah. So, Well, I mean, great question, of course. Um, and I think that we don't see a lot of lawyers raising it. You see it raised in pockets in individual cases around reasonable use of force between police and a child, issues of duress, um, other right. ways in which reasonableness comes into, again, articulating criminal responsibility. Um, but it's not used uniformly. I do want to raise also, though, to your point about, you know, where, where are the reasonable people and the, the reasonable adults in the room? The reality, as you know very well, is it's not only police, but it's also prosecutors who control so much of the entry into the system or the exit from the system. And to the extent that we have a small but hopefully growing group of progressive prosecutors across the country, I know you have one here in Boston, we obviously have one in Philadelphia, they are making changes. And I can speak specifically for some of the work that Larry Krasner is doing in Philadelphia, which is completely revamping and dramatically expanding pre-arrest, pre-police contact in a way diversion for kids specifically, right. really changing that universe. And I think it's so important to engage that stakeholder because again, they have so much control over who goes in and who goes out, making those decisions about transfer, that the more that their colleagues can become like-minded about the ways in which the system does not promote public safety if we do business as usual and are willing to be innovative, um, I think that can get us towards the direction that you're talking about. Agreed, agreed. And, I think and we they're, have they're gatekeepers, time for one so. more. Thanks. No, we're, we're filming, Jake. You need to talk to the microphone. It's hard to get over. So hi, thank you. Uh, something that I uh, mentioned to you, uh, Marsha, before be, uh, we began is, uh, you began, is uh, some of the efforts that are going on uh, nationally, uh, legislatively, which have relied in large part on the brain science. So California created a rule uh, a few years ago, precluding custodial interrogation of juveniles 15 years of age uh, and younger relying on reforming juvenile justice, specifically citing it uh, in the legislative enactment, which is unusual. And uh, they recently uh, uh, blew up the felony murder doctrine uh, and, and, and applied it retroactively, requiring that in order to be found culpable of felony murder, it has to be shown that you were A, the shooter or the, the murderer, two, you were the major planner or better, or three, acted with extreme indifference. And this rule applies to uh, probably about a thousand incarcerated uh, California inmates. So that's uh, pretty uh, substantial. The question I wanted to ask, uh, though, is uh, 
Uh, what do you see or forecast in the aftermath of the Malvo uh, appeal, which was argued in October of 2018 uh, in front of the Supreme Court regarding perhaps expanding the scope of uh, Miller Montgomery hearings? I know it's not going to be of much help to Mr. Malvo. Well, it's, it's, but, uh, well, it's been dismissed. So, so what happened in, so Malvo was the DC sniper. And the question before the Supreme Court in the Malvo case was whether or not Miller, which was about mandatory life without parole sentencing schemes, could be extended to discretionary sentencing, where an individual received a life without parole sentence, had a discretionary hearing, but didn't have a Miller hearing. So certainly Malvo, who was sentenced in 2003, didn't have a Miller hearing when he received life without parole. Um, the case was dismissed, I think, actually formally today because Virginia, yay, Virginia, passed a statute that was signed earlier in the week um, that uh, provides for anyone who has a lengthy sentence in Virginia uh, to have the opportunity to go before a parole board after 25 years. So Malvo will benefit from that. And the lawyers on both sides, the Virginia AG and counsel for Malvo, petitioned the court to dismiss it. That's a really good thing, having been at the argument. Was not sure how that was going to go. Um, so I'm glad the case was dismissed, although there are other cases raising the very same issue in the pipeline. And to Jay's point, I think that you know, there, there, are, there are lots of tentacles that spin off of these cases, and we don't have time to go into all of them, obviously. The issue about discretionary life without parole, the issue about de facto life without parole, where someone is serving, you know, 100 years is simple. Is 50 years life without parole for someone who goes into prison at 17 years? Um, how do we measure that? These are all cases that are percolating through the courts, through the state courts, and through the federal courts of appeals with differing outcomes. I mean, there's much more victory there than on the straight 18 to 25 line of litigation, um, but uh, it's keeping us all busy and you know, more to come. But I've, I'm not confident that we're going to get more progress out of this U.S. Supreme Court right now. So I'm going to invite you to come uh, make your comment or question to the panelists because it's, we're past time. And uh, if folks are uh, willing to stay around and, and speak with us more informally, we're, we're here. But I'm going to let those who need to go, go. Thank you very much. Thank you.